Case number 113103 in the matter of the marriage of Joanne Williams and Alfonso Williams. May it please the court, my name is Mike Lee Reiling. I represent the appellant Alfonso Williams in this case. I would request five minutes for rebuttal. Five minutes is granted. I also want to say up front, uh, I intend to have all the issues raised in this case. There is one that's a little more overwhelming and that's the jurisdictional argument, but in the event I don't get to it, I want to consider it to be submitted with the briefs. So just so it's clear, we're not abandoning any issues. This case involves military retirement and a division by the district court of that under the Uniformed Services Former Spouses Protection Act, USFSPA. The case started on October 8, 1993, when Mrs. Williams filed a divorce action in Shawnee County against Mr. Williams. She filed the petition. She did not include any claim for military retirement benefits. Mr. Williams filed a pro se answer on November 29, 1993, and he did not raise the issue of military retirement benefits either. The parties were unable to agree, and a trial went forward on January 31st, 1994. During the trial, the Ms. Williams' attorney did raise the issue of wanting to divide military retirement benefits. Um, there really wasn't a lot said about the military retirement benefits during the trial. The, um, there was some cross-examination where Mr. Williams talked to or examined Ms. Williams about an offer he had made uh, to submit to the military retirement benefits. The judge indicated after the, the trial that he was concerned about his ability to award military retirement benefits. And we don't hear too much until a <coughs> journal entry was filed in which the court did find had jurisdiction, but there were no specific findings regarding how jurisdiction under the US uh, USF SPA was accomplished. Not there much occurred. Counsel, there were no objections at that time from your client about the division, correct? That's correct. And no appeal? No appeal. No objections to the journal entry and no appeal. The uh, matter goes on for about 19 years, and Mrs. Williams files a request to garnish uh, Mr. Williams. Um, it, I guess it's important to note that because of the length of the marriage, the court was not able to order the U.S. to withhold the benefits. They have to come through the, the serviceman. So the order was for Mr. Williams to pay this. Mrs. Williams then files a, a request for garnishment. Mr. Williams files an objection and asks that the court set aside the order for lack of jurisdiction under uh, the USF SPA. And what's the procedure? Because our standard of review may depend on what your procedural mechanism for that is. I'm trying to figure out what was the basis, the procedural basis for the motion to set aside. Well, that the court lacked jurisdiction. And if the court lacks jurisdiction, it can never enter a valid order. So, so 6260B4 or 6? The, the actual motion was to, to set it aside, and I'm not sure it cited that particular section, but the, the, um, there was relief requested that the court did not have jurisdiction. Um, the issue under the, the USF SPA deals with what, consider, what is considered to be consent. Uh, the act is very clear in that it requires the military personnel to consent if it's not the home state of the servicemen. In this case, there's a lot of questions or, or, or facts thrown around, but there's never any finding that this was the home state of Mr. Williams at the time 
the Court of Appeals determines that Mr. Williams consented by lack of objecting to it. That was basically their conclusion. The position of the appellant, however, is that, number one, this is subject matter jurisdiction. And I know that the Court of Appeals in Fox and the Court of Appeals in this case both held that it was personal jurisdiction versus subject matter jurisdiction. However, it's important to understand the McCarthy case. And the McCarthy case is a United States Supreme Court case wherein the Supreme Court said, OK, you do not have state's jurisdiction over military retirement benefits. Just under the current law and the current scheme, you don't have it. Did they say they don't have jurisdiction, or did they say federal law preempted? Federal law preempts it, but you couldn't divide it. You don't have the ability to grant it. Do you have any authority to cite to us that says preemption is the equivalent of subject matter jurisdiction? I don't have anything that says that preemption is subject matter jurisdiction, but it would have to be subject matter jurisdiction because that's what the court's lacking in preemption. If you don't have jurisdiction over it, it's going to be subject matter jurisdiction. Is that true, or is it the situation where you have two courts with concurrent jurisdiction, but the federal law preempts the state court from exercising its power or authority? The way that the decision was made by the Supreme Court was that the states did not have it and the law preempted it. That's true. But what was missing was the ability to exercise jurisdiction over the subject matter, subject matter jurisdiction. And I realize it's maybe a play on terms, but what the U.S. FSPA had to come back to is to give the states the power to enter into these types of arguments or these types of awards, and it had to be subject matter jurisdiction because that's what the courts were lacking. We had personal jurisdiction over the servicemen. Servicemen had, they were subject to division of the property, the children, all of those things were available to the courts prior to the passage of the U.S. FPA, but we did not have, or the courts did not have the ability to act on the military retirement, which is a subject matter issue. So when it talks about the military serviceman consenting, we're talking about consenting to subject matter jurisdiction. That's not possible as a matter of law, counsel. I mean, parties can't consent to subject matter jurisdiction exercised by a court. It either exists or it doesn't. You meant consent to personal jurisdiction. I mean, that's a matter of consent under the act and under law generally because it can be waived, but subject matter jurisdiction can't be consented to by any party. If it doesn't exist, it doesn't exist. Well, under the U.S. FPA, until the serviceman consents, the court doesn't have jurisdiction if they're not falling under all any of the other items. And so I understand what you're saying, but the U.S. FPA does specify that the court doesn't have jurisdiction over that issue. It's not a question of being over the person. It's a question of over that issue. So the U.S. FPA provides jurisdiction over that subject if the serviceman consents. It provides ways in which it can be waived. The federal preemption can be waived. And doesn't the fact that the legislation provides for a waiver negate your argument that preemption is subject matter? Because as we've said, you can't waive subject matter. 
either is or it isn't. And so it seems to me that when they set up exceptions to preemption, they're not, they're creating something different than a jurisdictional question. Well, I understand what you're saying on, on the preemption argument, but it's, it's still a matter of whether or not court has jurisdiction. In order for it to occur, the serviceman has to consent. So whether it's subject matter jurisdiction or personal jurisdiction, it's still, a, the statute still requires consent. Well, we usually say, uh, in, in, or we have said in, in, in this state, that uh, the court's jurisdiction is, is set up by statute, ordinarily. And here we have a statute that specifically provides the court with authority to divide the military benefits, do we not? We do. And so, uh, as a matter of Kansas law, we have a statute that tells the district court it has authority to do something. Why isn't that subject matter jurisdiction? That is subject matter So the only thing, the federal law says, no, you may have jurisdiction, but we have uh, superior rights here. But that doesn't destroy the, the establishment of jurisdiction in that district court well, as a matter of state law. You have subject matters jurisdiction subject to the military personnel consenting to it. Let me, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut off because, the question and answer. I have, have a question when you're done. Okay, because it's true, the state statute creates subject matter jurisdiction, but that jurisdiction only applies under certain factors that aren't relevant here and if you consent. So it has to be a consent to subject matter jurisdiction. Council, I wanted to talk about the exceptions, one of which you've been talking about, and that is consenting to jurisdiction. The statute sets out three of them. One of them is you have jurisdiction by reason of the service member's residence. Correct and his or her domicile. Correct. Aren't those traditional elements or badges of personal jurisdiction? Yes, they are. So what does that have to do with establishing subject matter jurisdiction? I'm a little confused. Well, it, it is confusing. This whole military retirement issue gets confusing, which is why there are so many cases all over the place and so many different versions. I, I'm, I'm not disputing that subject matter jurisdiction comes from the, from the statute, the state statute. But it has to be consented to. The subject matter jurisdiction has to be consented to by the military personnel. So the consent itself is to subject matter jurisdiction from the state. If the, if the military, the court still has jurisdiction over the individual. If the individual refuses to consent, and let's just say in this case, Mr. Williams came in and said, I'm not consenting. What the court lacks is subject matter jurisdiction at that point. Because it cannot go forward on that subject. And I understand the state statutes, what provides subject matter jurisdiction, but what Mr. Williams is consenting to under that scenario is subject matter jurisdiction, not personal jurisdiction. Where do you get that from the statute? I get it. What, what in the statute supports the argument you just made? That it requires consent. So, and that's the only um, place that you would point us in the statute is that subsection 1C, quote, his consent to the jurisdiction of the court. Correct. There's no other, that, that's the only provision? That's, that's, that's what, it, that and the, the way it operates and the fact that the, the court would not have subject matter jurisdiction but for that provision. Counsel, I see you're out of time. Would you like about 60 seconds to wrap up? Uh, yes, I would. And, and one of the things I want to point out, too, very quickly, is that not only is it important, we, we've talked about subject matter jurisdiction versus personal jurisdiction. Still, the idea is what does it take to consent? In this case, 
Mr. Williams is, is being said, okay, you didn't come forward and object to jurisdiction. Uh, that's one side of the argument. The other side of the argument is that counsel for the petitioner or, uh, could have easily asked Mr. Williams if he was consenting to, to the, the jurisdiction. That could have been an easy question to ask. And this court is going to be asked to determine whether or not consent can be done through inaction or silence. And in this case, the Court of Appeals is saying silence is consent. Would be far better in terms of a decision and in terms of these cases going further if you required an affirmative act. In other words, the the petitioner's attorney would have had to ask, are you consenting? Couldn't well, the statute have said that, if that's what it intended? The statute says it requires consent, but it also doesn't indicate that if you, if you fail to object. I mean, it could be written the other way around, require you to object. That's in essence what's been done with the Court of Appeals, is it's rewritten it to require the objection to occur. It says consent. So the affirmative act under the statute is for the individual to consent. The Court of Appeals has turned that around and said, you've got to object. So having, having said that, I, I just didn't want to get caught up into the um, personal versus uh, subject matter jurisdiction, because either way, Mr. Williams never consented. There's nothing there where he said, yes, I consent. Well, he filed an answer. He filed an answer, but he, the answer was to nothing involving uh, military retirement benefits. Okay. And he denied personal property in the answer. Let me ask you on the attorney's fees issue. Uh, I read your argument to be limited to the authority of the court to impose the attorney's fees, not the amount. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Good morning. Um, it is an honor to be here today. Ms. Williams certainly appreciates you taking the time this morning to consider these arguments. Uh, in listening to counsel, I, I think I'm pretty simple on this case, and maybe that's just my limitations, but when I look at it, I think things are pretty clear in this particular case. You had a situation where the wife, Joanne Williams, follows a rule. She does what she's supposed to do with a file for divorce in the state of Kansas, and where Alfonso, for whatever reason, chose not to follow all of those rules, and at some point, asked the court to make some rulings on an issue that's almost 20 years old at the point. The, uh, the Justice was right. There is a specific statute in the state of Kansas that allows the division of this particular asset. That's, that's really not disputed. Um, I guess the question is how do we get back here 20 years later almost? And I think one of the justices brought up 6260. I mean, I, I suppose you could try and utilize that particular statute to get there but I think you have some hurdles to jump through and explain to the court why you waited so long, and that certainly wasn't addressed in this case. So that still, I think, remains a question for this court. At what point does this thing become final? Um, I mean, how many decades are supposed to go by before a court's decision is, in fact, um, a final decision that somebody can actually act on? And in this case, you had Joanne showing up um, about 15, 16 years later saying, uh, I need a garnishment in place to collect on this particular judgment. And it wasn't until then, at that point, that uh, Alfonso decided that he was actually going to challenge uh, what the court had done so long ago. And then the other question is, where is she supposed to go if, if the court decides, ultimately, that Kansas wasn't the place where we could do this? Well, she's kind of out of options on this particular issue. There is no superior court. There's, there's no venue, I think, that's more appropriate in this particular instance. Um, and this was, this was never discussed. Um, Justice was right. There was, there was an answer that was filed in this case. I think there was JAG counsel that was um, helping out the uh, Alfonso file his answer. And although it was more of a general denial, um, he still appeared. He still participated. Um, he did not issue um, or offer any objections to the court when it was making decisions that affected him on any issue, not just the military retirement itself. 
The uh, the other thing that's not so really you're you're arguing an implicit consent. I think that express um, and implied consent existed in this particular case. I think based on what what the court uh, did in this matter, and more specifically, I think what Alfonso did not do. Um, consent. I'm sorry to interrupt, but consent to what? Consent to all the issues. Consent, not just consent to, to personal jurisdiction, or consent to the court considering the substantive issue of division of military. I time. think he certainly considered, or I'm sorry, consented to personal jurisdiction, and I think at that particular point, I really feel like that's all the court needed. That well, that was kind of my follow-up question. I, I, are, I take it you're not conceding that your client was required to consent in some fashion to the to the consideration of the substantive. Court. The substantive question of division of military I time I'm not understanding your question. My client, that my client didn't consent. Well, I'm probably not being clear in my question. I'm just trying to, to to be specific about what kind of consent you're arguing. Well, I, I think um, I think based on the facts that are before this court, there is implied consent that the court had jurisdiction over this particular issue. And there's a couple of things... So let me just stop you there. Yeah. Do, do, do you agree with your opposing counsel then that subject matter jurisdiction in this particular case can exist or not exist based on a party's consent? No. The So why, why are we talking about implied consent to consider well, the subject? I guess, I guess that's a good question. And I... I, I would just go back to, I guess, the federal statute that was talked about earlier in his argument, the 10 U.S.C. 1408. And it flat out says that the court has jurisdiction if you know, there's a residence, if there's a domicile, or if there's consent to the jurisdiction. And in this particular case, I think it's important to note a couple of things about this situation um, I think the court should focus on. One, you know, they were clearly residing in Kansas. You know, the, the record, I think, would reflect that both parties had Kansas driver's licenses. They had a home in, in Kansas. Alfonso might have been residing um, outside of the state for work purposes uh, for some time. Um, however, it, it was clear that I think the, the domicile certainly did exist. And, you know, as far as whether or not there was any question as if the court was going to be dealing with this issue, there were, you know, some testimony about the discussions they had about dividing the military retirement. In fact, you know, one of the things um, that I found significant about the record in this case is that uh, Alfonso shows up, I think, to the trial. He brings some person named Mosley with him, and he, I think, identifies him as some sort of a military expert that's going to help him with these issues. And I think the guy even sat down at a council table um, next to him, and the court, you know, had him seated in the gallery shortly thereafter. But, you know, Alfonso knew what was going on that day. Um, he was there to fight about it, and the court made some decisions that he didn't like, and then he didn't challenge it. He walked away, and and nothing happened, and nothing happened for an incredible amount of time after that. So I think you know the federal law in this particular case is very clear about how jurisdiction exists, and I think the facts certainly support under those factors that we had jurisdiction at that particular point, and to come back now. Um, you know, so many years later, I, I guess, yeah, the first question is, well, how do we even do that? How do we even get there? And then after we do... I, I don't understand. The, the federal statute's clear about how jurisdiction is uh, uh, invested on the state court. I, I don't understand that premise. The district court in Kansas obtains its jurisdiction to hear this through state law. Right, and the, the statute federal, The federal statute cannot imbue the district court with with state jurisdiction. That comes through the state statute. All they can do is preempt right. and say, you may have jurisdiction, but you can't exercise it uh, 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 when uh, we preempt it. Well, the, the state law exists. I don't, I don't think anybody's disputing that, and I think council concedes that the state law did, in fact, exist um, to divide it itself. And I think that the only question for this court is so, whether or not so if that if that's correct if it's a preemption not a an investment of jurisdiction but a federal preemption that can be waived or um, 
we waived in three circumstances, one of which is consent, then we're really talking about um, uh, consent to waive uh, something, and in other contexts, especially in the criminal arena, we've required consent to be a knowing and intelligent um, act. In other words, a person has to know. Here, Alfonso would have to know about the uh, federal preemption before he could waive it. You, well, don't, you don't get accidental uh, waivers uh, in that context. And, and it sounds like to me that we have the, the implicit waiver here um, sort of runs afoul of, of those other cases that in other arenas where we say it has to be knowing and intelligent. Well, I guess if I'm understanding your comments correctly, I, I think what the court needs to consider in, in, in criminal case, I think it, uh, it follows suit, and that is that how far is the court willing to go? You know, in this case, the court told Alfonso, look, you know, you might want to get an attorney here. You know, this is something we're dealing with serious issues, and he flat out refused to do that for whatever reason. And I, he had an attorney. I, like I said, I think initially he had a JAG attorney for whatever reason. He didn't follow up with that. He decided to represent himself. But I guess how far is a court willing to go in this case to say he was offered all the information that he could possibly get. He just chose to ignore it for whatever reason. This is an adult. This isn't a situation where we're interrogating a juvenile defendant and we're trying to figure out if he can understand the Miranda forms or not. This is a situation where you have an adult, a professional, an educated man, um, and he's advised by the court very specifically, here's your rights. This is what you know, we suggest that you do. And he chose to go a different direction. So I think you know, when you're talking about you know, his knowing and understanding waiver there, he had every opportunity um, to use the information the court gave him and do what he was supposed to do under the state of the law. He, just, he chose to ignore that. And I, I don't know that I'm willing to say that he didn't. Um, willfully choose. It might have not been discussed at length, but the opportunity to do exactly that was offered to him, and he, he chose not to not to follow up on it. So I I I think that addresses what you're talking about. I does that kind of answer your question, or okay. give you some insight into what uh, Miss Williams is asking the court to do here today? Um, I take it that your argument is not only that the state court had subject matter jurisdiction, but also that the state court's order was not preempted by federal law. It is. By virtue of the fact that uh, husband was under the personal jurisdiction of the court. That's, that's exactly correct. And um, I appreciate you characterizing my argument as such. Um, to, to clarify, that's exactly what we're saying here. I just, I, I think when you do look at uh, the body of the facts, I mean, nothing's really disputed here as to what happened, how it happened, the information the court had at the time, the information that Alfonso had at the time, and the tools that were available to him way back when um, to challenge this if he wanted to. And in fact, if at some point um, Joanne did not file um, what you know, she characterizes a garnishment, um, you know, to try and collect her judgment, you know, we might not still have a challenge to that. Um, Had she collected any of his military benefits before that? So she waited 15 years to try to collect? I think she waited until the retirement, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, okay. Um, so that was uh, uh, when they were awarded, they were in court. Correct. Uh, may never have come about okay so it, when it was when it was her ability to collect on that judgment and she wasn't um, getting paid pursuant to the court's orders I think she sought some relief there and called it garnishment but ultimately the court uh, they treated that like a motion to enforce counsel and here we are sorry I didn't mean to cut you off if we could rewind this to the day before this 
divorce action was filed, based on your knowledge of the facts and the law, how should your client have proceeded differently so we would not be here today? Well, I don't know. There's, there's anything that she could have done um, beyond, I, excuse me, beyond what counsel um, earlier was maybe suggesting, and that's that um, the court didn't specifically ask him. You know, I, I don't know if that would have helped this court today if the court just flat out asked him, "We're dealing with this today. Do you consent to jurisdiction? Um, do you understand? You know, all the rights that are available to you here." Perhaps, but I don't think it's a solution to say, well, she could have gone to a different jurisdiction to handle this, um, or she should have styled her pleadings differently. I honestly don't have a question for you because I think the argument here is that she did everything she was supposed to do. Um, the question is, is do we hold Alfonso accountable for the things that he did not do? Uh, the court did what it was supposed to do. And I, so I don't really have an answer for you as to what my client you know, should have done back in 1994. And it's your belief, based on your understanding of the facts and the law, that putting your client's actions aside, that had, her, uh, had Mr. Williams done the simple act of saying, I expressly consent that we would not be here today? Well... I'm not saying that, I know in your view that's not necessary, but if he had done that in your view of everything, would that have taken care of all these issues? I think it would make, certainly make things a lot easier for you. And I, I think that's what counsel alluded to during his argument as well. The court never did this. Um, you know, why is he questioning that? And I guess I would question the same thing. You know, would it have helped? But under these particular facts, I just don't know that it does. I don't know that it had to. And, you know, the court was very comfortable doing what it did at the time. Um, and, and the other thing, too, is you know, years later, when we do get back, um, you know, I believe there's a, a motion um, by uh, Alphonse in this case to clarify or modify the judgment itself. And so he's seeking the court's relief on certain things and not on others. And, you know, that's just, at this point, that's all on him. I, I just, I, I wish I could tell you that I think it would solve the problem today. I just honestly don't know if that would be helpful to you based on, on what I'm seeing in the law um, and the state of the facts of, of this particular action. All right, thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Right, thank you, counsel. Thank you. Counsel, I'm gonna, going to ask you the same question that I finished with opposing counsel on. In your view, we would not be here today if your client during the hearing would have stood up and told the judge under 10 U.S.C. section 1408C3, I hereby consent to the jurisdiction of this court, unquote. We'd be done, is that right? Correct. That's all that's missing. That that would be it, or if he'd have said, I object. If he'd have said either one of those two, we'd be done. Uh, and that, uh, Your Honor, you bring up an important point because if you rule that you can go through and look at the facts and decide whether there's a quote unquote waiver and silence is a factor, then, then you're gonna set up all these cases are gonna depend on facts driven on what did the what did the military person do? What was said at trial? What, if you require there to be an express statement, I either waive or I don't, then it's going to be a, an easy litmus test in the future going forward that you have to identify, counsel, that you're waiving or that you're not waiving. Um, and in this case, the individual that wants the retirement benefits is the petitioner. And she has to show that the, the Mr. Williams consented. Um, 
It, it's or a mess. If the, or if the judge had found under the evidence that Mr. Williams' domicile was in the court's jurisdiction or if his residence, other than because of his military assignment, was within the jurisdiction. Is that correct? That's correct. If he'd have, if he'd have found that, although we probably would have contested that evidence because uh, there was plenty of evidence introduced to show that the intent of the parties was to go down to Texas. Um, so we would not have agreed with it, but if the court had found that, uh, there certainly would be a better basis for jurisdiction in this case than there is but now. You couldn't have done that today. You couldn't have contested it today because unless you've got a jurisdictional in today, you have no procedural vehicle to challenge this divorce decree and the associated rulings. Uh, right? Based on the facts, yes, yeah, we, need, we would have. It would have had to have been appealed at the time. <clears throat> yes, the, mm -hmm. there's no question. If the court had found that it was based on domicile and he hadn't appealed it at that point, it would have been res judicata. Yes, but the court didn't make any findings on that. Just found that he had general jurisdiction uh, and did not make a waiver, a finding of waiver. Uh, I believe there's. Do you? Go ahead. I believe there's. Quite a bit of case law that says in effect that if a party shows up and contests the issue they've submitted to personal jurisdiction of the court why isn't that sufficient to satisfy consent to the jurisdiction of the court under section 1408 because the the personal jurisdiction under the usf uh, USF SPA is a little different and it requires consent, express consent under there. It uses it's the term. It doesn't consent. say it express consent. consent. Well, I understand it doesn't say express consent, but it doesn't indicate that it can be unknowingly waived. It doesn't indicate that it can be, that, that you're required to object either. The, the, Do you agree I, that under the statute, if jurisdiction had been based upon residence or domicile, there would have been no need for any mention to have been specifically made about retirement benefits. There's nothing in the statute that says you must have established domicile and residence and it must be explicitly known that one of the disputed issues will be the division of the military retirement. Is there? And I'm, if, I'm trying to follow you, but I'm, well, I'm not where I'm quite headed understanding is, the question. If the court has jurisdiction to divide military benefits just by finding residence or just by finding domicile, why they, can't the court have jurisdiction to divide the military benefits just by establishing consent to personal way, to, to consent to personal jurisdiction? What is the basis for saying that if you have consent-based jurisdiction, then you have one more step that's not present in the other two situations, and you have to take the additional step of affirmatively accepting uh, that retirement benefits will be an issue in the case. Well, it goes back to, I think, in part, the intent of the federal act, and the intent is that if you're uh, a resident of that state, if you're, if you're somebody there, that you're going to be... Uh, I don't know, treated better is the word, but the idea that that's, you should not be allowed to form shop and go through and do that. So if you're there in your home state, there's going to be a different set. And if you're in your home state, the court's going to have jurisdiction over it. It's when you're not in your home state that the, the legislation is protective of but, the serviceman. But doesn't having him show up and at the hearing, file an answer, go through the trial, give those same protections. He, he actually came to Kansas and did that, whether he was resident or domiciled here or not. Well, she has, he has two kids. Let's say that you did want a form shop. You can find the most favorable state and union move to, and then what are you gonna do? You don't show up, and then you don't talk about your children, you don't do all that. So I think the act does contemplate form shopping and that there is the idea that it, this is there to protect the service person from form shopping. So if you're not the home state and you're not domiciled there, then the, the test is different. And the test is you've got to consent. Uh, and in our position is you've got to 
to consent by saying I consent uh, to the jurisdiction of the court for purposes of military retirement. And the equities, I understand the equities here. The equities are you didn't, you didn't object, but the, the equities are also you didn't ask the question. Nobody asked the question. Well, but they put the asset on the table and he didn't object. That's the, the, that's the problem I'm having, and that's the distinction with the cases that you cite. Um, I, I'm not understanding what you the mean. The retirement by... benefits were discussed in the courtroom and were divided up in the journal entry, and there's no objection, there's no appeal, there's nothing. He even made an offer to split up some of them. You know, that was discussed at the, at the, at the hearing. So, so the asset is, is in play, as he, I understand this case. He made an offer prior to the hearing, that was testified to during the hearing, the offer would be to consent to jurisdiction, but there was never a consent to the jurisdiction over the retirement benefits. Again, if you rule that, that there's some sort of a process where you can come up with consent short of a, an actual statement that I consent, then you're going to see more of these cases. But we're not inventing this stuff. Implied consent, a, a concept in the law. It existed when Congress uh, authorized this legislation and just used the word ex consent. If they wanted to say express consent, they could have said that. So you know, even under a statutory interpretation rule that would say Congress is presumed to know the law, you know, implied consent is not some strange new animal that we're just up here talking about. It's been around for a while. I'm not saying it is, but I am saying that there is a concept here that you are protecting the serviceman from form shopping. That's, that's, that's the bottom line of this. Otherwise, the, they would have just prohibited it completely. And so the concept of protecting the service person from form shopping would imply that there needs to be some sort of affirmative knowledge of a waiver and consent, not just accidental or just not knowing what the law is. Counsel, let me turn this around a little bit. Your client, we know, filed an answer, participated in this hearing or trial. And let's change the result. Let's say that the judge ruled in your client's favor. Does your, when that is challenged, does your, his victory, does he then say, well, there's no jurisdiction for them? Or does he say, I won fair and square, and we'll take this up on appeal someplace so my spouse can appeal this, and I will then argue there was no jurisdiction for it? I'm a little confused. Does he get, juris there's no jurisdiction only when he loses? Well, uh, if you're saying he won, I'm not sure how he could have won. I'm, change, I'm changing the facts. If the judge had said, I'm not going to divide this property, okay. your military retirement plan is all yours, sir. Mm -hmm. is, is that what? a final order? Is, it, is that your question? Has he consented? Is that a, a binding order? I'm, well, based on the fact that he has not expressly consented to jurisdiction of the court per your argument, as I understand it, it seems to me he would say, well, this is of no force and effect. This court had no jurisdiction. And he'd be subject to that. And I guess the opposite side is that she could go wherever he is now and move, and she could be making that argument to whatever court he's in that state. So, yeah, I mean, it's a mess. I mean, it's... Either way, it's it's not uh, a good thing. But uh, certainly, in, in the Pennsylvania case that we cited to the court, that court indicated that they have mechanisms, unlike Kansas, to deal with post-divorce issues between the parties. They have a statute that allows the the Pennsylvania court to divide this type of military retirement after the fact. And there are some cases that we cited to where the courts have divided uh, retirement benefits after the fact. So it could well be that the, the petitioner in this case, if she lost, would be going to another state and arguing he didn't consent. And so it's not a binding ruling. All right, thank you. Do we have any further questions? 
All right. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. I thank both of you for your arguments this morning. Court will take this matter under advisement.